In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, Amen. Intro e por altari Dei. Iudicame Deus et Tishani Causa, Amen. Gloria Patri et Filii et Spiritui Sancto. Intro e por altari Dei. Aditorium nostrum in nomine Domini. Confitir Deo Omnipotente Beati Maria Semper Virgini Beata Michele Arcangelo. Beati Ioni Baptiste Sanctis Apostolis Petro et Paolo, Omnipus Sanctis et Fobis Fratres, Quia Picavi Nimis, Cogitazione Verbo et Opere, Mea Copa, Mea Copa, Mea Maxima Copa, Idio Precor Beata Mariam Semper Virginem, Beata Michele Mercangelum, Beata Miona Baptistam Sanctus Apostolos Petrum et Palum, Omnes Sanctus et Vos Fratres, Orare Pro Mea Dominum Deum Nostrum. Amen. Miserator vestri omnipotens Deus et demissis peccatis vestris perducat vos ad vitam eternam. Indulgentiam absolutionum et remissionum peccatorum nostrum tribuat nobis omnipotens et misericors dominus. Deus tu conversus vivificabis nos. Ostende nobis domine misericordiam tuam. Domine exaudi rationem meam. Dominus vobiscum. Oremus alpha. In medio ecclesiae a perudos eus et in plevit eum dominus spiritus sapientiae et intellectus, stolam gloria induit eum, bonum est confiteri domino et salari nomini tua altissime, gloria patri et filio et spiritui sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. In medio ecclesiae a perudos eus et in plevit eum dominus spiritus sapientiae et intellectus, stolam gloria induit eum. Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. Gloria in excelsis Deo in inter pax hominibus bone voluntatis. Laudamus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te, glorificamus te. Gratias agimus tibi propter magnum gloriam tuam. Domine Deus rex celestis Deus pater omnipotens. Domine fili unigenite Iesu Christe. Domine Deus agnus Dei filius patris, qui tolis peccata mundi miserere vinobis, qui tolis peccata mundi suscipe deprecationem nostram, qui sedes ad exteram patris miserere vinobis, quoniam tu solis sanctus, tu solis dominus, tu solis altissimus, Iesu Christe, cum sancto spiritu, in gloria Dei patris. Amen. A dominus fobiscum. O Remus, Deus qui popolo tuo eterne saluti, salutis beatum Bernardum, ministrum, tribuisti, presta quesimus et quem doctorum vitae habuimus in teris, intercessorum habere meriamur in celis. Per dominum nostrum, Iesum Christum filium tuum, qui tecum vivit et regnat in unitate spiritus sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. Lexio libri sapientiae, Justus corsum tradit ad vigilandum di Lucolo ad Dominum, qui fecit illum, et in conspectu altissimi de precapitur, aperiet os suum in orazione et pro delectis suis de precapitur. Si enim Dominus magnus voluberit, spiritus intelligentiae replebit illum, et ipse tamquam imbres mitet eloquia sapientiae sue, et in orazione confitebitur Domino, et ipse dirigit concilium eus et, disci et disciplinam, et in absconditis suis consul conciliabitur, ipse palam facet disciplinam doctrinae sue, et in lege testamenti Domini gloriabitur. Colladabunt multi sapientiam eus, edusque in seculum non delebitur, non recedit memoria eus, et 
nomen eos requiretur a generatione in generationem, sapientiam eos enerabunt gentes et laudem eos enunciavit ecclesia. Osius de medita vitre sapientiam et lingua eos loquetur judicium, lex dei eos in corde ipsius et non supplantabuntur gracius eus. Alleluia, alleluia, amavit eum dominus, edernavit eum, stolam gloria induit eum. Alleluia. A Dominus Vobiscum. Sequentia Sancti Evangelii secunda Matteum. In il tempore dic sitiesis discipuli suis, vos estis altere, quod si sal evanuverit in quo salietur, ad Nicolum valet ultra nisi admitatur foras et conculcetur ab hominibus, vos estis lux mundi, non potest civitas abscondi supra montem posita, neque accendunt lucernam et ponunt eam submodio, sed super candelabrum ut luciat omnibus qui in domo sunt, Sic luciat lux vestra coram hominibus, ut vidiant opera vestra bona, et glorificent patrem vestrum qui in celis est. Nolite putare coniam veni salvere legem al profetas, non veni salvere sed ad implere. Amen qui pe dico vobis, donec transia celum et terra, iot unum aut unus apex non preteribit, a legi donec omnia fiant. Qui ergo salveret unum de mandatis istis minimis, et decuverit se comines minimus vocabitur in regno celorum. Qui autem feceret et decuverit hic magnus vocabitur in regno celorum. Uh, the epistle appointed to be read for the Feast of St. Bernard of Clairvaux is taken from the Book of Wisdom. The just will give his heart to resort early to the Lord that made him, and he will pray in the sight of the Most High. He will open his mouth in prayer and will make supplication for his sins, for, it shall, for if it shall please the great Lord, he will fill him with a spirit of understanding, and he will pour forth the words of his wisdom as showers, and in his prayer he will confess to the Lord, and he shall direct his counsel and his knowledge, and in his secrets shall he me meditate. He shall show forth the, the discipline he hath learned, and shall glory in the law of the covenant of the Lord. Many shall praise his wisdom, and it shall never be forgotten. The memory of him shall not depart away, and his name shall be in request from generation to generation. Nations shall declare his wisdom, and the church shall show forth his praise. And the Holy Gospel is taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus spoke to his disciples this parable, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hidden in a field, which a man having found, hid it, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like to a merchant seeking good works, good pearls, who, when he hath found one pearl of great price, went his way and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like to a net cast into the sea and gathering together all kinds of fishes, which when it was filled, they drew out and sitting by the shore, they chose out the good into vessels, but the bad they cast forth. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall go out and shall separate the wicked from among the just and shall cast, cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth 
Have ye understood all these things? They say to him, Yes. He said unto them, Therefore every scribe instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like to a man that is a householder who bringeth forth out of his treasure new things and old. Thus far the words of today's holy gospel. And so here we three, myself, my server, and uh, my technical support, uh, are all alone in the Church of St. Anthony in Wanganui, New Zealand. For those of you who may be uh, tuning into our uh, live stream mass, which will continue at the same time uh, every day uh, until finally uh, there is a lifting of the present um, uh, COVID uh, levels of uh, confinement. Uh, we're in presently in level four, which is the highest level here in New Zealand. And therefore, we um, are not allowed, of course, to uh, hold public uh, masses uh, in our church. And so the church is empty, uh, as you have seen it perhaps for the past uh, two days. Um, and yet, we bring to you, uh, via the marvels of technology, such as those are, uh, a live stream mass, which will continue uh, for as long as we are probably in at least down to level three. Uh, we're scheduled. Uh, however, would that schedule be honored? We don't know. To remain in level four until midnight tonight, uh, New Zealand time. Um, even then, if we go down to level three, we will not be able to resume our uh, regular schedule of masses. Um, and if we go down to level two, we will be able to resume public masses, but they will be limited as to number. And so uh, please do stay tuned, if you will, uh, as further announcements will be made. Uh, when, if and when uh, these levels of the COVID levels uh, are, are, are lowered. Um, but until then, um, if you cannot come to Mass, certainly you can participate in the merits and the graces of this Mass, albeit offered uh, to you electronically. Nonetheless, those graces do come to you. Uh, you participate uh, morally uh, from afar, it is true. Uh, in the graces of this Mass, and you should certainly, during this Mass, um, make a spiritual communion, which is uh, just as efficacious as a sacramental communion, uh, joining with the priest and the server uh, in making their, our communions here as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Events today are certainly uh, remarkable, uh, and yet they only serve to focus our attention, I think, on the immense changes over the past two millennia of the Christian era. And St. Bernard of Clairvaux was at the beginning of the very peak of Catholic faith and the public witness of that faith throughout the world. St. Bernard of Clairvaux was a man of the uh, late 11th into the early 12th century. We may perhaps trace the rise and the fall of the public expression and adherence to the Catholic faith from approximately the 6th century when St. Benedict began uh, Western, uh, Western monasticism um, until the Second Vatican Council. The Second Vatican Council truly marked the uh, mortal blow, if you will, to the public expression of our Catholic faith. Uh, that is manifest, that is obvious, and I will not go into the details of that. Um, many of you know that very well. Others of you who are perhaps younger uh, perhaps will come to know it. Um, it is a truly remarkable event uh, which perdures to this day. St. Bernard of Clairvaux was one of the early founders of one of the most vigorous monastic orders in the history of the Church, the Cistercians. Um, they are one of the flowerings, if you will, of Benedictine monasticism, the Cistercian monasticism. 
Indeed, Cistercian monasticism was a reform of a Benedictine monasticism, which by today's standards was absolutely towering in its holiness. It produced many saints. This was the Abbey of Cluny in, in, in France, many saints. It produced even at the time of the so-called Cistercian reform. And when St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who was born uh, in, uh, near Dijon in France, uh, first was a young man, um, we may look at his character and the quality of his personality and we may say perhaps that had he been inclined to anything that he put his hand to, he would have been a giant in whatever it would be. Had he been a politician, he would have been an emperor. Had he been a military man, he would have been a great general leading armies across the world. Um, had he been, thanks be to God, an evil man, there's no, no telling what evil could have been done. But as it was, St. Bernard was utterly taken by the call of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to give himself over to monasticism. Not Benedictine monasticism as such, a monasticism which had not at all grown cold. It's simply that a small group of men believed that it was not being uh, vigorously enough uh, followed. And St. Bernard came upon the three early founders of Cistercian monasticism at the point when they really were failing. It was not doing well at all. They had left the Abbey of Malem in France and had gone to uh, Citeaux. Uh, in order to, uh, which was a marsh, it was a swamp, in order to found the first uh, Cistercian uh, monastery, Cistercian coming from the Latin word for Cito in France. And St. Bernard of Clairvaux at mere age of, I believe, 22, uh, was completely struck with this and drawn by God's command to join himself to uh, this early uh, faltering, then faltering, uh, reform of Benedictine monasticism and this was in the late uh, 11th century going into the 12th century. Uh, 1098 is the date assigned to the foundation of the first uh, Cistercian monastery and thereafter largely due to St. Bernard's incredible personality, his towering holiness, his enthusiasm if you will, this order multiplied amazingly to countless monasteries, uh, even to this day. There are numbered, I believe, 269 monasteries, uh, Cistercian monasteries of both the strict and the common observance throughout the world, even today. Um, in his time, he was such a charismatic youth, 22 years of age, that young men flocked to him to join this, entered this effort to uh, refound monasticism. Not refounded, it was doing fine under the Benedictines, but the Cistercians thought they could do better, be more strict, be more holy. And indeed, St. Bernard was all those things. And these young men flocked to him. He would go through towns and villages of France, and mothers literally would hide their young men, push their young men under the beds of the bedrooms, and sit on the, on the bed so that the young man couldn't get out and follow Bernard, who as he went through, his band grew until finally arriving at the gates of Citeaux in 1098, there were uh, 30 and more young men with him. And these young men with him and this spirit of intense fervor and monasticism that St. Bernard exerted, especially through his example in sermons, served to populate France with numerous monasteries of the Cistercian observance, which then spread to all of Europe and finally even into the New World. Some of you may be familiar with the Trappists. The Trappists are a reform, then again, of the Cistercians, uh, which was made by the Abbe uh, de la Trappe uh, in, uh, the, in the late, uh, mil uh, late Middle Ages, actually the Renaissance Ages, um, and quickly took over uh, the Cistercian uh, heritage throughout the world. Um, speaking more personally of my own personal history as a, an American, um, when I left the United States Air Force in 1971, 
um, I came to a monastery of the common observance, not the Trappist, not the stricter, so-called stricter observance of, this is the order that, again, St. Bernard of Clairvaux founded with three others. And this monastery was a fairly old monastery in the middle of Wisconsin, in the, uh, in the, mid, uh, the um, Midwest, as they called it. It was a lovely little monastery. It was founded originally from Austria. Uh, and it was composed of monks from Austria, monks from Hungary who had fled uh, the, uh, the Cistercian Monastery in Zirz, Hungary, uh, because of communism and the closure of that monastery uh, in the 19, early 1950s. And so they thrived for a while, but uh, Second Vatican Council came along, and that truly was the death knell, not just for the Cistercians, uh, but for all religious orders throughout the world. We cannot imagine what religious life was uh, before this present age in which we live. So robust was it. Um, at the end of World War II, for example, the major Cistercian monastery, Trappist monastery, which many of you perhaps have heard of, I doubt that many of you born after 2000 would have heard of it, but many of my age uh, have heard of it, the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane, which was in Kentucky and had been founded in the, uh, eight, I believe, at the 17, 17 or 1800s. At the end of World War II, its most notable monk was well known among American soldiers returning from Europe and from the, uh, the Second World War in Europe, from the fighting that had gone on there. And there was a monk in the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane uh, called, his, his secular name was Thomas Merton. His religious name was Father Lewis, Father Lewis, Trappist monk, brilliant man, a uh, convert from Protestantism. And he wrote such books as the uh, Seven Story Mountain, which was a, a compendium, a history of uh, his journey from Protestantism to Catholicism and finally finding his way as a monk at the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane. Brilliant book. I read it myself. And after that, of course, another book, Waters of Silloway, and another book, The Seeds of Contemplation. Very good books. Very good books. These books were handed out by Catholic chaplains, military chaplains, to the American soldiers throughout Europe, France, Italy, Greece, Germany, so forth. Um, and these young men, boys, most of them, read these books avidly and were so moved by them they determined, they, they, they resolved they would join the Trappists when they returned, if they returned home to the United States of America. And indeed, at the end of the war in 1945, all these young men came home and the first thing many, <coughs> excuse me, many of them did was to go directly to Kentucky, go directly to the Abbey of Our Lady of Gethsemane and join it. They had at one time after World War II over 1,000 monks in that monastery. Over 1,000 monks. They had so many monks, they couldn't fit them in the monastery. They had to pitch tents in the cloister of the monastery to house them. And uh, they throve. They, they, their, 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 their observance was incredible, uh, fervent. This showed the spirit of this order founded again by today's Saint, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, the Cistercians. It was a magnificent movement, a magnificent religious revival, which again ended only with the uh, Second Vatican Council, which pretty well dried up all religious observance. My own personal um, contact with the Cistercians, as I mentioned, started in Wisconsin at the common observance, not the strict observance, not the Trappist, uh, in Wisconsin in a place called Oconomowoc. It almost sounds Maori. Um, and a lovely monastery, as I mentioned, but it was not doing well. It was suffering from the ravages of the Second Vatican Council, and eventually it had to move uh, because the neighborhood around it stopped being farmland and uh, open fields and instead grew up into rich mansions and palaces even uh, of the wealthy of Milwaukee. And they didn't not like this monastery in the midst of their lovely homes. And so uh, it was sold, and the monks, the few that were there, 
moved further west to the western part of Wisconsin, a place called Sparta, an apt name for a Cistercian monastery probably. I had before that point, however, left them because I could see the direction that it was going. And instead I joined another Cistercian monastery, which was in Pennsylvania, uh, St. Mary's Monastery, which was a foundation from a Trappist monastery uh, in Massachusetts, uh, Abbey of Our Lady, Abbey of St. Joseph, St. Joseph's Abbey. Unfortunately, all three of these monasteries, uh, the mon monastery of the Abbey of Our Lady of Spring Bank and its movement to Sparta, Wisconsin, and the other monastery uh, in Pennsylvania, they are today all gone. They're all gone. No vocations, and those that founded them are all passed away. Which is a small microcosm of what certainly has been happening all over the world to the Cistercians, both strict and common observance. There are perhaps in many of these monasteries a few relics rattling about uh, in its walls, uh, all of them in their 70s or older. And of course here in New Zealand we have one Trappist monastery, about the same. Another in Australia, from which we get our altar breads, by the way, uh, about the same as well. And so it's kind of a commentary, I think, on the uh, venue, on the um, environment, on the, um, um, the signs of the times. Monasticism is an, inc is, is an ancient, ancient institution, even predating Christ. Uh, the early Jewish Essenes, uh, the ones who uh, took care, uh, filled the, the, the urns with the Dead Sea Scrolls by the Dead Sea. These were, these were monks. The early prophets before Christ, they were basically monks. Um, St. John the Baptist was one of these. Um, the Carmelites on, our, on Mount Carmel were among these as well. The monastic movement has always been with mankind and under St. Benedict, the Christian form of it, the Catholic form of it began and throve. It, th it throve throughout Europe and throughout the rest of the world. Who of us do not know of Benedictine monks? And even the Cistercians. And more from the Benedictine monks, there were the Camaldolese, that's another order. And another from St. Bruno in France, the uh, Carthusians, another order. All of them, all of them today in grave decline and tending finally to uh, demise. They will not survive. Which shows, I think, the toxicity of the present age, the toxicity of the modern world, that such a basic human endeavor, which predates Jesus Christ, should be completely annihilated, close to it today, annihilated by the modern world and what, where we are in the modern world. Um, it is truly a remarkable event and certainly must presage, I think, the end of time itself. When that will be, who knows? But it is a grave uh, loss to the world that its most precious treasures, the church's most precious treasures, the monastic life, should have fallen due to indifference, lack of interest, and yes, to the uh, destruction of Catholic life uh, as a result of the Second Vatican Council. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, as I said, if he had been a military man, would have been a great general. If he had been a politician, he would have been an emperor. Whatever he would have put his hand to would have been magnificent. And as he did, he put his hand to the monastic life. Magnificent. Cistercian monasteries were all over England before <clears throat> Henry VIII. It was said that you could not stand anywhere in England at the time of Henry VIII and not see a monastery, most of which were Benedictine and Cistercian, most of which, or Carthusian. That's England. That's just England. Little island kingdom. Hundreds of monasteries dotting its countryside, all gone, ruins, or in ruins. To put a bit of a period, I suppose, on this, getting back to our saint of today, St. Bernard of Clairvaux. As I mentioned, we live in an age today wherein the highest ideal of Christian life seems to be that of an accountant, that is, we balance our books to ensure that every debit of our life 
be perfectly reconciled by a matching credit. At our best, we're accountants. Such an ideal, if it can truly be called that, sometimes is the driving principle of the highest aspirations of the modern age. And that's, this explains, I think, why this age, why our age, why the present age is so desperately mediocre even in its highest aspirations. We won't go to the lowest. And so today's Saint Bernard of Clairvaux is the perfect antithesis of today's worldly wisdom, which is why today's worldly wisdom rejects it. In fact, it's unknown to today's worldly wisdom. So powerful was St. Bernard's appeal to the youth of his day, as I mentioned to you, that mothers hid their sons under their beds, lest they follow Bernard on his way to Clairvaux. He's known as Bernard of Clairvaux. That was the first monastery that he personally himself founded. It was, or as it was, Bernard brought 30 lads with him to Clairvaux, one of the earliest monasteries that would explode in fecundity throughout Europe as well in, as, in, as I mentioned, into the 20th century. It was Pope Pius XII who called today's Saint Bernard of Clairvaux the last doctor of the church. And he titled him the mellifluous doctor. That is the honey-tongued doctor. And Saint Bernard's principal theme was not God as adorable, nor God as honorable, or God as worthy of all praise and subservient obedience, but God as lovable. And of course, in his mind and his teaching, while certainly worthy and even compelling of man's abject service, God, his adoration, his obedience and his sacrifice to God, St. Bernard insisted that none of this did God in the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ, our Lord, most insistently long for. That's not what God wanted from us. And at the end of the day, what God and Jesus Christ most ached for was man's equally aching love for himself, and which is so rare to find. Our Lord himself said, we have to long for him. We have to desire him or we shall never have him. And how many today do long for God? Oh, they long not to go to hell if they believe in that at all. That's not a longing for God. They long to be always well, never to be sick. That's not a longing for God. They long to be well off, or at least have enough to live on. It's not a longing for God. These are good things, but they don't long for God. And if we don't long for God, we won't have him. It's that simple. And while not dispensing from the necessity of, of penance and reparation from man for his sins, what God the Son, according to St. Bernard today, St. Most pined for, was man's motivation of longing and love impelling him to do penance and reparation. And this was most eloquently expressed in a uh, reflection, St. Bernard's reflection, on the passage from the Song of Solomon one of the books of the Old Testament, also called the Song of Songs. How many of you have read the Song of Songs? Actually, it was not permitted to monks in those days to read the Song of Songs because it's quite a remarkable book. You should read it. The Song of Songs, the Songs of Solomon. And St. Bernard preached on one phrase from this Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, in chapter 1, verse 2. The second verse of it. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. This is the writer of the Song of Songs. It's a, it's a love poem. The whole thing is a love poem between God and man. And St. Bernard took this book from the Bible as really the most expressive of his own soul. And he begins his commentary on this particular text, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, saying, 
Today the text upon which we reflect is taken from the book of our own experience. We must therefore turn our attention inward, each of us, taking note of our own particular awareness of the things I'm about to discuss. This is St. Bernard. I'm attempting to discover if any of you has been privileged to say from his heart, let me kiss him with the kisses of his, let me kiss me, or let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. And those to whom it's given to utter these few words from the heart are very few. But anyone who has received this mystical kiss from the mouth of Christ, if only once, seeks again and again that utterly unique experience and eagerly looks for its frequent renewal. Indeed, it shall be the only thing that will sustain us throughout eternity. I think that nobody, this is St. Bernard again speaking, I think that nobody can grasp what it is except the one who receives it. I should like, however, to point out to persons like this, that is, those are, who are burdened with sin, as we certainly all are, that there is an appropriate place for them on the way of salvation. Such may not rashly aspire to the lips of a most benign and lovable bridegroom, but let them prostrate with me in fear at his feet, at the feet of the most severe Lord. As loving and as lovable is, God is severe. All you who are conscious of your sins do not regard as unworthy or as despicable that position which the holy sinner, St. Mary Magdalene, laid down her sins and put on the garment of holiness. It is up to you, wretched sinner, to humble yourself just as she did so that you may be rid of your wretchedness. Prostrate yourself on the ground at his feet, take hold of them, caress them with kisses, bathe them with your tears, which washes not them but yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. So though you have made, he goes on, St. Bernard, though you have made a beginning in kissing his feet, you may not presume to rise at once to his mouth. There is yet another step to be surmounted in between an intervening kiss on the hand for which I offer the following explanation. Long did I lie in the slough of the marsh, filthy with all kinds of vices. <coughs> Excuse me. If I return to it again, I shall be worse than when I first wallowed in it. On top of that, I recall that he who healed me said to me as he exercised his mercy, Now you are well again. Be sure not to sin any more, lest something worse may happen to you. <coughs> he, however, who gave me the grace to repent must also give me the power to persevere in repentance. To repentance object, love. And now I'm able to see what I must seek and receive before I may hope to attain to a higher and holier state. It is a long and formidable leap from the foot to the mouth. Consider for a moment, still tarnished as you are with the dust of sin, how would you dare touch those sacred lips? Yesterday, you were lifted from the mud. Today, you wish to encounter the glory of his face? No. His hand must be your guide to that goal. On having received such a grace, then you must next kiss his hand. That is, you must glorify his name, not yours. You must glorify him first, because he has forgiven your sins. Second, because he's adorned you with virtues. What else shall we carry with us when after we leave this life? And once you have had this twofold experience of God's benevolence and these two kisses, then you need no longer feel abashed in aspiring to a holier intimacy, which he longs for more than you. It's my belief, says St. Bernard, that to a person so disposed, God will not refuse that most intimate kiss of all, a mystery of supreme ardor and ineffable sweetness. 
And so you have seen the way that we must follow, the order of procedure. First, we cast ourselves at his feet. We weep before the Lord who made us. We deplore the evil we've done. Then we reach out for the hand that we need to lift us up that will steady our trembling and weakened knees. And finally, when we shall have obtained these favors through many prayers and tears, humbly we dare to raise our eyes to his mouth, so divinely beautiful, not merely to gaze upon it, but, I say it with fear and trembling, to receive its kiss. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Christ, our lover, is a spirit before our face, and he who is joined to him in a holy kiss becomes through mutual desire one spirit with him. And he concludes, To you, Lord Jesus, how truly my heart has said, my face looks to you, Lord. I do seek your face. In the dawn you brought me proof of your love in my first approach to kiss your revered feet. You forgave my evil ways as I lay in the dust of my sins. With the advancement of the long day, you gave your servant reason to rejoice when in the kiss of the hand you imparted the grace to live rightly. And now what remains, O oh good Jesus, except that suffused as I am with the fullness of your light, and while my spirit is fervent, you would graciously bestow on me the kiss of your mouth and give me ecstatic joy in your presence forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs> Dominus Vobiscum <coughs> Oremus Sancti Bernardi Justus Apama Flore but Sicu Cedrus Quae Libano Est Multiplicabitur Omnipotent. 
Per omnia saecula saeculorum, Dominus Vobiscum, Sursum Corda, Gratias agamus Domino Deo Nostro. Veri dignimit justum est ecum et salutari nos tibi semper dubique, gratias angere. Domine Sancti Pater Omnipotens Eterni Deus, per Christum Dominum Nostrum, per quem maestatem tuam laudant angeli, adorum dominationes, Tremon potestates, celi celerumque virtutes, ac beatus seraphim, socia exultatione concelebrant, cum quibus et nostras voces, ut hat mitibi este precamor supplici, confessioni dicentes, sanctus, 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 dominus Deus sabaot, plenis in celi et terra gloria tua, hosanna in excelsis, benedictus qui venit in nomine domini, hosanna in excelsis. <coughs> Yes, GPN did him pretty hard.
to a corporal citizen. Oh, me. Nobis walk with Pecatori, but son of the Per omnia saecula saeculorum. O Remus, precepti salutaribus monitiet, divina institutione formatia demus dicere. Pater noster qui es in celi sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, viet voluntas tua, sicut in celo et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum danubis hodie, et dimitin nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem. <coughs> Amen. Per omnia saecula saeculorum, pax domini sit semper vobiscum. Agnus Dei equitolis peccata mundi miserere nobis. Agnus Dei equitolis peccata mundi miserere nobis. Agnus Dei equitolis peccata mundi dona nobis pace. Celeste Machipiam, no longer in the book. A domine non some dignus, domine non some dignus, domine non some dignus, it is.
예수 그리스도 Vestri omnipotens Deus et de missis peccatis vestris perducat vos ad vitam eternam. Indulgentiam absolutionum et remissionum peccatorum vestrum tribu et vobis omnipotens et misericors dominus. <coughs> Equitol et peccatum undi. Domine non sum dignus, ut interest subtectum meum, sed tantum dic verbo, et sanabitur anima mea. Domine non sum dignus, ut interest subtectum meum, sed tantum dic verbo, et sanabitur anima mea. Domine non sum dignus, ut interest subtectum meum, sed tantum dic verbo, et sanabitur anima mea. Vita eterna. What do you mean?
Mi veli servus a prudens, quem can stitu et dominus superfamiliam suam, ut detilis in tempore tritici mensuram. A dominus fobiscum. Oremus. Ut nobis domine tua sacrificia dente salutem, Beatus Bernardus, confessor tuus et doctor egregius, quae sumus precator accedat, per dominum nostrum Jesum Christum filium tuum, qui tecum vivit et regnat in unitate spiritus sancti Deus, per omnia secula seculorum. A dominus fobiscum. Ite, misa est. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus, Dominus Vobiscum, Initium Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem, In principio erat verbum, et verbum erat apud Deum, et Deus erat verbum, hoc erat in principio apud Deum, Omnia per ipsum facta sunt et sin ipsum facta mes nihil quod factum est. In ipso vita erat et vita erat lux hominum et lux in tenebris lucet et tenebris em non comprehenderunt. Fut homo misus a Deo cui nomen erat Ioannes hic, venit in testimonium et testimoni per hiberit de lumine, ut omnes crederent per illum non erat ille lux sed ut et sed ut testimonium per hiberit de lumine. Erat lux vera quae luminat omnem hominem venientem in hunc mundum. In mundo erat et mundus propsum factus est, in mundus eam non cognovit, in propria venit et sui eam non reciperunt. Quod quod altum reciperunt eum dedit eus potestatem filius dei fieri, eus qui credunt in nomine eus, qui non ex sanguinibus, neque ex voluntate carnis, neque ex voluntate viri, sed ex deonati sunt, et verbum caro factum est, et habitavit in nobis, et vidimus gloriam eus gloriam quasi unigeniti, a patri plenum gratiae, et veritatis. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs of mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God. Let us pray, O God, our refuge and our strength. Look down with favor upon thy people who cry to thee and through the intercession of the glorious and immaculate Virgin Mary, Mother of God, of blessed Joseph, her spouse, of thy blessed apostles, Peter and Paul, and of all thy saints, do thou mercifully and graciously hear the prayers which we pour forth for the conversion of sinners and for the freedom and exaltation of Holy Mother Church through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Holy Michael, Archangel, defend us in this day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast down to hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. O oh, most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus, most sacred heart of Jesus.